Let's go back to the late 1970s. 40 years ago, NASA launched what would become one of its most famous, one of its most important missions. What happened? Well, two Voyager spacecraft were sent off to do what had never been done before, map the solar system and revolutionize our understanding of space. Three, two, one. We have ignition and we have liftoff. We have liftoff of the Titan Centaur carrying the first of two Voyager spacecraft. Hello from the children of planet Earth. Yeche dai hui an aur aganoizo. Now, to mark the 40th year of the mission, Ema Reynolds has made a film about the Voyager spacecraft and the people involved, and it's fascinating. Good morning, Ema. Good morning. Um, how do you get involved in making a film like this? Because the access to footage and to NASA that you must need, well, it needs to be complete, doesn't it? How did you, how did you get that? Well, we, you know, we had to obviously get all the approvals from NASA, but they were really on board from the start with the kind of film we wanted to make. You know, there had never been, this is such an amazing, extraordinary adventure story, and there had never been seen on a big screen before. You know, there had been fine television documentaries made about it, but we wanted to give it the big, epic cinema visual story that uh, treatment that the story deserved so you know we approached them with that and wanted to talk to the scientists and engineers who were right at the heart of the mission and tell the story firsthand from their perspective so NASA were really excited by that uh, that story and uh, yeah, we got all the approvals you know to get to the archives and talk to the people involved and this is something you were passionate about doing well, what was it about the this story which captivated you so much I've been in love with space and science, a bit of a space geek since I was a child, wanted to be an astronaut, all the cliche, but I remember, um, in fact, it was a BBC programme, The Sky at Night, during the 80s, Sir Patrick Moore doing a programme about um, Voyager 2 getting to Uranus, you know, the very first spacecraft ever to reach that amazingly distant world. I remember just being blown away by these amazing images of this pale blue planet and that we'd never seen up close before. So, yeah, just myself and my producer, John, we were a bit obsessed with Voyager, a bit, obs bit obsessed with space. And uh, when Voyager uh, 1 entered interstellar space in 2013, it was back in the news again, you know, after this long 40-year journey, nearly 40-year journey. So it was a perfect moment to try to tell the story. And Voyager 2 was took over from Voyager 1 and just carried on going out. That's correct, isn't it? Yeah, Voyager 2 is the one that was able to, after they su succeeded at Saturn, which was the prime mission, it was sent on then to Uranus and Neptune, which is the only spacecraft that has ever been to those planets. And the point was that it will keep on going, it will not come back because it will take a part of us or at least a snippet of us then into space, in, out into the universe. And it sent, a lot of this center, centers around a golden record, which I think is going to be explained quite clearly in this clip and then we'll talk to you about that. Okay. All of planetary exploration to me is a story about longing, the longing to understand the significance of our own existence to say to the universe, we're here. Know us, you know, where are you? The people who actually did the science part of Voyager are always jealous and mad because the golden record gets more attention than all the wonderful things they did exploring the outer planets of the solar system. But the main attention goes to the golden record. Any kind of effort to contact the extraterrestrial intelligent life it's more fascinating than knowing the chemical makeup of a mineral on Mars or something. Let's give it some more attention, shall we? Because <laughs> I'm fascinated by it. So this is an actual golden record, which yeah. contains all these sounds and messages. Um, and the idea is that it would be played 
by something, somebody, when they find it out there. Yeah. But there's no method of playing it. So, no, they included a cartridge and stylus in the package, in the actual, what they sent on the spacecraft, and also instructions as to how they might play it, and so that if they played it correctly, it would yield a certain image, and then they'd know they were, it was turning at the same speed. So it's kind of mad, because we couldn't even build a turntable ourselves, now, never I mind an alien. If I found a vinyl now, I don't think I'd be able to play it in my <laughs> house. Good, so absolutely. I don't know quite what... Their vinyl's uh, coming back. Vinyl's, vinyl's back vinyl's for trendy back. people, not for me. Yeah, I'm with you. Um, <laughs> but so the difficulty in choosing what should be on that record, because there are something like, is it 50 odd greetings in different languages? But to, in order to give a snippet of who we are, what we are, to understand us, there, were, there was one piece of music on there. No, there's a 27 piece of oh, music. Oh, 27, but yeah. one pop song. I well, only one pop one song. Pop yeah, song, they said sorry. that they only had enough room for one And which was? Johnny Be Good. Johnny Be Good. Yeah. See, and I just, and no Elvis. No Elvis, no Bob Dylan, no David Bowie. I mean, Bowie, yeah, you yeah, put Bowie on that. <laughs> I would, you? yeah. yeah. Well, one of the contributors in the film, Tim Ferriss, said, you know, there's obviously a lot more great music that's not on the record than is on it, which would be a pretty pathetic planet if we only had 90 minutes of decent music. It's amazing. Do you think what's on that record is a still representative of what we are as humans on planet Earth? I think it's a pretty good snapshot, you know, like they only had 90 minutes that they could fill and they wanted to... Their principle was not just to show like American or contemporary music, they had an, over 50% of the music is ethnic recordings, mm. Peruvian pan pipes and Javanese gamelan, you know, so they, they had a very s small amount of space they could fill. So they had Mozart and Beethoven and Bach. So there was arguments obviously as to what they could do. So uh, we'd all argue, I'm sure, all night about what they should put on, but I think it's pretty good snapshots. And let's just get to be clear, where is it now? <laughs> <laughs> so Voyager 1 is nearly, is over 12 billion miles away, nearly 13, and Voyager 2, which has not yet left the solar system, is just about 11 billion miles away. So they're both kind of going in two different directions. Voyager 1 has entered interstellar space, which is an extraordinary historic achievement. Um, when do we lose signal? Because we're still getting odd bits of data. We, we, we listen to them every single day. They, they send back signals every day. And in fact, the signal takes over 18 hours from Voyager 1 to reach Earth, you know, so it's, a, it's very, very far away and the signal is very, very weak. But we will communicate with them apparently, hopefully for another five, maybe even 10 years before they lose, they lose when track. When you hear those little signals, I bet that makes your heart beat. It's so beautiful, isn't it? It's so poignant. And when you think these, these two spacecraft will, in all likelihood, outlive humanity, they're going to be out there circling the Milky Way galaxy for millions, even billions of years, containing this little record of our existence. So it's extraordinarily poignant and romantic idea, isn't it, that perhaps when we're long gone, uh, this, this little mark of our existence will be out there. Ema, thank you so much. It's a, it's a wonderful story, spectacular story. And Ema's film is called The Farthest. In a moment, we're going to talk to the Michelin-starred chef, who's also a judge on the BBC's new primetime cookery show. First, though, let's have a last brief look at the headlines where you're watching us this morning. We'll see you in a sec. Hello there, good morning. The Scottish Government's efforts to control, stop and prevent smoking is working, according to scientists and health experts. A review conducted by the University of Edinburgh and NHS Health Scotland says there's been a positive impact over the past five years. It found there's been a substantial decrease in the proportion of children exposed to second-hand smoke at home. But smoking continues to be a bigger problem in more deprived areas. Scotland is to benefit from the bulk of a £42 million funding package for farmers and crofters in remote and rural areas. The UK government is to extend a support scheme while Brexit negotiations continue. 